I think he is not able to hear us. Okay. Doctor, Doctor Indramani. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just give a minute. Uh, he, should, he should be all right. Uh, welcome, Professor Gajan Singh is there now. Good morning. Good morning. Good yes. morning. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Indramani was here. Just mm -hmm. now he is missing somewhere. I think he's checking the connection. We'll give him a minute. He is there. He is there, but uh, my video is not on. So we'll take a couple of minutes more that you can introduce yourself and talk to each other. Another couple of minutes till Dr. Indramani comes. So I'm here. Yeah, you are there. Yes. Yeah. Ah, please start introducing. I think we'll start now. You start introducing uh, Dr. Manzul Hazarika and start the program. Yes. <laughs> Professor Singh and friends, <laughs> greetings from IST. This is the uh, third day of the webinar. And first two days, I'm at a will. Yes. 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 Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. And this is third day. Now we see that Dr. Yasenjha and Dr. Mehta. Yeah. I uh, want to yeah. first day also. <laughs> so friends, uh, we have uh, two uh, speakers today. Dr. Manjul K. Hajarika from AIT and A.P. Ramachandran uh, from Coimbatore. So it is a real uh, you know, good combination because uh, uh, Ram Chandra is uh, a practicing farmer, uh, accomplished high-tech farmer, and he is an agricultural engineer, postgraduate in uh, production technology. And before that, uh, Dr. Manjul K. Hadarika, uh, he is uh, uh, our uh, you know well-known uh, agricultural engineer. He did his uh, B.Tech from Jabalpur, and uh, MTech from IIT Kharagpur and PhD in Civil Engineering from University of Tokyo. And Dr. Hazarika is currently the Director of Geoinformatics Center at AIT Bangkok. Professor Singh is here, who has been the architect of uh, AIT Bangkok. I have also personal nostalgia. I was there in 1990 and then again in 1999. So, uh, AIT. He has uh, almost 16 years. He has extensively worked in disaster management issues in more than 20 countries from the Asia Pacific as well as the Caribbean regions. His work includes uh, uh, multi hazard assessment, emergency mapping, and damage assessment community-based disaster management, and capacity building. He's been actively involved in developing it for and with PC plans. Estimating that particularly by uh, floods. While working, uh, he interacted and worked closely with the stakeholders of various levels, including high-level government officials and donor entities. No voice. Is that a problem? Am I? Uh, you go ahead now. So, yeah. Dr. Hazarika has been uh, closely associated with the ISAE. He was at Pune Convention and he, uh, there was an active participation. Before that, he was, uh, in, he is, uh, you know, a very good trainer. So, he was for one month at Rowdy and for cast training. And uh, I, 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 I have feedback that. Uh, 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 candidates there uh, got a lot of benefits and today we have uh, the Azarika he will be you know 
is taking on a very important topic related to drone. And uh, now on behalf of ISA and that webinar team, I invite that uh, Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, hello. Dr. Azarika, you can continue. Yeah. So, my, can I uh, <laughs> uh, share my slides or I cannot? No, you can tell. You can tell. He'll start the slide immediately. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. Thank you. So, thank you. For, uh, uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, Dr. Indramani and I, uh, Professor Singh and uh, ISA uh, uh, community in India. And it is my great pleasure to be speaking uh, about uh, drones and its applications. And as Dr. Indramani introduced, I uh, have been uh, working mostly in uh, remote sensing application, remote sensing and GIS. And uh, last uh, uh, 15 years, I have been working on disaster related issues, mostly using. And uh, uh, in India also, we have, I have recently completed two projects in Uttarakhand after uh, there's a big World Bank project on risk assessment and decision support system. And right now we are developing a uh, uh, decision support system, um, uh, customizing existing one in Uttarakhand for COVID-19, which I'll share with you later, maybe uh, within a few days, uh, some of you. Uh, as far as uh, agriculture is concerned, I have been also started working with FAO here in regional office. Uh, we have been uh, doing several things with FAO. One is also, to assess the crop damage by flood using satellite data and uh, so forth. So that's one of my new new area. Uh, uh, back to uh, habitat again in agriculture a long time. And it has been, uh, uh, and we are started working in several countries right now. Now the topic today, drone and its applications. Uh, I am also joined by my colleague, Sasanka. He's in my back, he will also talk about a little bit of uh, uh, drone uh, uh, development. Uh, we also build drone by ourselves, so he's the man. And <clears throat> so I will, uh, first part, I will talk about the uh, basic drones, uh, basics of drone, and then what are the applications uh, can be done, especially focusing on uh, agriculture. Then I will ask Mr. Sasanka to uh, talk about uh, drone how we are building our drones. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, uh, they are basically, uh, if you want to acquire data, one of the common platform is satellite. Then we, uh, which is most popular, I would say. Then we have these aeroplanes, like you might be uh, hear, um, heard about aerial photographs in uh, old days. And also, hello. Yeah, yeah we can hear you. We, we can hear you. Go ahead, yeah. please. Then we have the conventional surveying techniques. So this is the these are the uh, uh, mainstream data acquisition platform, but drone has surfaced in very, uh, very recently which is in between, uh, say, aeroplane and ground survey. And uh, this has been coming up very strongly in many countries because, uh, next slide, I will explain. Okay, so these are the four uh, platform satellites, um, which is uh, very extensive coverage and wide spectral cap capability it means they have uh, several bands or cameras uh, to take the images. Uh, but problem is it is expensive and relatively if you go for affordable one, which will be maybe 30 centimeter and so, um, uh, not expensive or even free, 
but uh, if you go for high resolution one, like the drone one, it will be very, very expensive. And it can be taken data weekly or bi-weekly, something like that. Then the aircraft, um, large single flight coverage, also high resolution, seven centimeter per pixel. Again, wide spectral capabilities. But uh, the cons is also, again, very expensive flying a, uh, airplane is very expensive, and it also uh, <clears throat> uh, it, a lot of permissions are required, and those and operations are to for uh, And the on the other hand, last one, if you look at the surveying, this is excellent position accuracy, very high, uh, good resolution, but it is slow, tedious, and labor intensive, and difficult to. <clears throat> the, um, and some of the areas which is inaccessible, you cannot do the survey. But drone, uh, which is Im image acquisition on demand, satellite or aircraft, this you cannot do on demand, but uh, you have to take a plan ahead. But drone, it is with you, you can do acquisition anytime. Uh, very high resolution, up to one centimeter. Uh, no effect of cloud. Satellite has a problem with cloud. Air aircraft has a problem with cloud cost-effective and safe. But uh, limitations is uh, relatively low coverage and drone regulations can restrict operation. Even in India today, uh, drones are not uh, 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 private sector. Commercially, you cannot fly any drone as per the regulation as of today. So, and also, of course, operation is susceptible to weather. But still, you have some, uh, some windows um, uh, where we can still fly drones. Next slide. Okay, so in terms of performance, um, if you look at the horizontal um, uh, x-axis, price, accuracy, flexibility of location, technological maturity, market maturity, and delivery time. And the y-axis, uh, zero to 10, 10 is uh, the good, good uh, and zero is poor. So if you look at the, Price-wise, um, uh, uh, the satellite is, as I said, very expensive. So this, um, uh, in terms of grading, it is low. A drone is quite almost 10 point. It means it is drone price is almost, I mean, if you have a drone, it is free, basically. Uh, data is free. And then accuracy-wise also drone, very high accuracy uh, in compared to all others. Uh, flexibility of locations, I mean, where you fly and all, so you can, uh, that is also quite flexible enough. Uh, technological maturity, which is uh, still a lot of things are being developed, a lot of things are being developed, but market maturity is almost uh, uh, not really, uh, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you can, uh, there's a lot of scope uh, for drone. Um, uh, uh, in the uh, for, uh, in terms of market, they are projecting very high growth of drone market, and delivery time is also very good. Even if you fly today, some idea we sometimes within two day, one day, two days we can we can do that. Uh, next slide. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, drone saves money, money and time and uh, money time and provide quality data. So if you look at the low operation, uh, uh, for example, helicopter or aircraft, uh, which is quite expensive uh, in terms of uh, capital costs, operation cost. Whereas uh, if you go for drone, this is um, air, capital investment is very less and also operation cost is pretty pretty. You don't need a trained pilot like helicopter or airplane. And right side accuracy of, um, as, um, I mean, if you get a job within, um, if you do for surveying, conventional survey, which might take two to three weeks, with drone, we can do it one to four days. And below right side, you can see two images. One is from satellite, left side is drone, and right side is satellite. Uh, same area, but you can see drone image is uh, much better, which is around, uh, uh, five centimeter per, per pixel. And commercially, the, the most commercially, uh, commercial standard of data is now 30 centimeter. 
So if you go for five centimeter, it's still six times higher than high resolution satellite commercial satellite data. So it's, it's still advantage there. Next slide. Okay, so uh, drone is basically the relatively small size remote control automatic pilotless aircraft. There are different kinds of drones. The drones which I am showing you, all the three drones, first is multi-rotor. You have uh, several uh, uh, propellers. That's why it's called multi-rotor. It is this, all the three drones, multi-rotor, fixed wing, and the hybrid one, all three were developed here in our center. We, we assemble by ourselves. And the first one is a multi-rotor which can go up to 300 meter, 20 to 30 minutes flying time uh, and very small area because uh, you can see so many rotors, so a lot of energy is consumed. So it's only 20, 30 minutes you can fly. The left one is uh, fixed wing. Uh, it can go up to two kilometer, 90 minutes flying um, time almost. And it can uh, uh, five to 10 square kilometer per flight. And it can go up to 100 kilometer if, if uh, some kind of long missions you can send that. And the down one is a VTOL, uh, which is vertical uh, <coughs> uh, uh, landing and takeoff. And this is the new one, uh, because you see the left one, I mean, the fixed wing need a lot of space to landing. So it's a lot of problems. So we make uh, the, the multi-rotor and fixed wing together to make it VTOL. It can vertically take off and vertically landing. After vertical takeoff, you can take the round to uh, do the surveying and mapping. And after that, vertically take off. So this particular drone uh, up to 300 meters, uh, 40 minutes, and maybe one kilometer square per uh, flight, if you fly it in 120 meter, 120 meter height, and range is 70 kilometers. And this particular drone, we, uh, when a uh, uh, smile uh, said, uh, Doctor said, tell me, told me yesterday, then we immediately, yesterday we uh, tested this drone and we had a video, maybe hopefully we can show you today. Uh, so uh, that's next slide. Okay, next slide. Okay, so first uh, one of the most common, most common is surveying and mapping. So, <clears throat> For surveying and mapping, mostly we are using this uh, optical camera, RGB, red, green, and blue uh, band cameras. This is very similar to our, uh, our normal camera, even photographic camera. It can be also used. Uh, <clears throat> but if you go for very high accuracy, then camera price will be uh, exp quite expensive camera you can, uh, you can use also, photogrammetric camera, which we call. The right side is LiDAR. Uh, which is, uh, this LiDAR is, I think, 500 uh, gram weight. And this is from Valodyne, American one. And this can be also people are using in drone. But it has also a lot of other issues, but uh, I think very soon it will be uh, becoming very, very popular. Next, next slide. Next slide, yeah. Uh, okay. So this is uh, our team. Uh, 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 go up, uh, previous slide. Previous slide, please. Ito. Previous, previous slide. Yeah. Okay. So this uh, is the, um, our team, uh, they were in Colombo and uh, they uh, uh, fly uh, drone to get, get these, uh, some snaps out of Colombo city some a few years back. Next slide. And here you can see all the buildings very detailed. And then if you come for this slide, then you also get the height. So both mapping and uh, getting the height uh, elevation is uh, very much possible. But uh, it's way, of course, you have to fl fly in a certain way that you get the elevation. Particularly, you have to do, have some overlapping between two images <coughs> to get, get, the, get the stereo pairs. And that's how uh, this is also the uh, dark uh, green is the uh, very high uh, elevation and the blue is the ground level. Next slide. Hello. 
Okay. So the left side building is maybe uh, Professor Singh might know. This is the uh, Asian Development Bank building in Manila headquarter. So we are asked to uh, we are asked to demonstrate how drone can be used in ADB project. So we give a training, then we fly our drone and we get this three dimensional building uh, of ADB uh, within maybe. Five, five, six centimeter accuracy. It's a very good model we, we developed and they were quite impressed. Uh, right hand side also you can get the three heights. I'll explain uh, how it will be useful for us if particularly something related to agriculture related topics. Next slide. Okay. So agriculture, uh, use of agriculture, drone in agriculture, again, uh, we can use the optical supply, uh, optical camera, the left side. And the <clears throat> right side, uh, these are the multispectral camera, where is uh, like uh, red, blue, green, red edge, uh, infrared, all the camera, cameras uh, are there. It's, it has five here, you can see, five camera. This is the very similar to uh, satellite, very similar to satellite. Uh, satellite also have this kind of uh, camera. We can, uh, we can, we call sensors. Next slide. So uh, this is a very simple uh, vegetation index. Basically uh, when we, uh, if you look at the most of the uh, satellite data, remote, any remote sensing data, this concept is used to know the how green our vegetation is or a crop is. So this is called NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. So left side, you can say green one. So the in, in, uh, incoming sunlight, it is most of the in red channel, red channel, uh, I mean red band in the, all the energies, energy is uh, absorbed uh, with for photosynthesis. And in, in near, near infrared, all the 50% energy is uh, going out. On the other hand, if it is not green, then you see that there is a, what is okay, incoming is, not green, is very, very similar. So left side, if you calculate the NDVI, you can see 0 0.72 means it's very green, whereas there's no greenness, it's 0 0.14. So this value from zero to one, near 1.9, uh, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, uh, or more than point is very, very healthy visitation. Uh, that's the basic concept. And we use this particular principle for all the drone mapping related to agriculture. Next slide. Okay. So uh, monitoring a large plantation is a very painstaking job and time consuming task. So drone can provide a high resolution map to identify uh, anomalies in the images to identify pace attacks. Basically, I was uh, in consultation with some of the tea gardens in Assam. So they said that some of the pace come and very within no time, it will, uh, uh, it will uh, damage large uh, amount of their tea bush. So normally they have, Tea garden size are uh, average size is 400 hectare, 400, 500 hectare tea gardens are there. So manually they go and check. So uh, sometimes uh, 500 hectare uh, manually checking will take days. So if some pace attack come, uh, attack is there. So it will take some lot of quite amount of time to identify. So I think that if we fly drone, we can very quickly. Uh, take these, I mean, uh, identify this attack and immediately we send a team to do the spraying. So it will uh, also limit the use of uh, chemicals in uh, for pest control because you know, there are a lot of regulation. They have to, they cannot use many chemicals and also um, uh, type as well as amount of chemicals they have to uh, keep it within the limit. So this is one of the thing where I'm work, uh, working with Tea Garden in Assam. Next slide. Okay, so also uh, in some cases, um, you can see the invasive species, species uh, 
of uh, <coughs> vegetation, they go to the inside of uh, plantations. And at, uh, if it is a large plantation, so the drones would be very, very useful. Uh, at very short time, we can, we can see how, uh, what are the area effect, and you can send the team because all are, you have all coordinates and location of each of them. Next slide. Dr. Azarika, yeah. uh, just a small request. You have enough time, but we are all very happy to listen. This so clearly you're explaining. So don't worry about time limit. There is no time limit. <laughs> please, please go ahead. We want to understand. We want, we want, we have a lot of, lot of, lot of engineers, and budding engineers are listening to you on the, uh, on the Facebook. So I request you, please, if I slowly you go, if I everything. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Said. So uh, use of drone uh, in plantation is coming big way uh, because data coming from drones can be integrated GS to maintain an accurate crop database. But as I said, a tea garden has 500 hectares and some largest tree garden in Assam is around 800 hectares uh, or something like that. So uh, location specific information of those crops, uh, uh, plantation crops are very, very, easy using drone. And <clears throat> this database, uh, which could be information about the um, uh, some uh, location where fertilizers um, uh, 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 contain in the soil uh, or uh, some of the areas if uh, some uh, bushes are not doing well, some areas are uh, uh, not very healthy. So those are what I stress. This can be uh, when you're flying because you get the coordinated coordinates so you can easily do. And I think uh, this is one of the biggest applications uh, of drone is coming up in Malaysia and Indonesia for oil farm plantation monitoring. Because you see oil farm is maybe several, um, uh, 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 how much, maybe uh, 26, seven, seven, six meters maybe uh, high. Yeah. And then uh, it is very difficult, and they have to see the um, uh, see the they cannot see, they can see from the down they can, cannot see the up. So the drone is very useful to see the up and see why, if any problem any uh, any uh, any pace problem. And also, you know this uh, oil palm or tea garden coffee. These are monocrops. When there is a monocrop, there is a lot of problem with pests and diseases. Uh, uh, so that's why I think it's very effective. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, again, uh, I just mentioned oil pump. You can see the, from drone, you can see all the left side. Uh, you can see all the tea, bruise, uh, tea bruises. And also, uh, some of the tea, if quality is poor or not productive enough, this kind of image analysis and see the quality um, uh, tea um, uh, in terms of as a photograph or as a NDVI also. Uh, then you analyze and uh, you. Uh, and, and, uh, you can identify unproductive uh, uh, the plants and, and replace uh, that. And also <clears throat> some of the coconut tree counting right side. And I was uh, listening to some one of the uh, presentations uh, recently. Uh, they had the, there is a very big uh, typhoon and they uh, damaged the uh, coconut trees to a um, great extent. And, uh, government compensated by each tree. So it is very difficult to uh, difficult to know how many trees and where. So, but if you fly a drone, it will be, you can count the trees, damaged trees and also you can compensate to the farmers. So this is some one of the countries they have done. Next slide. Yeah, these are the, again, uh, land counting. And if there's a gap, you can you can feel, you see here, say some gap in this location or here. So the, um, uh, you can, uh, those kind of uh, things can be easily done. Otherwise, if you do manually, you have to really uh, <clears throat> go to all the places and see, and it will be very, very uh, time consuming and expensive also. Next slide. Okay, so this is biomass estimation uh, drone can be used. You see, what one of the problem with biomass estimation, we were working in Nepal Forest Department uh, uh, sometime back. We are using satellite data, both optical and microsatellite data. 
So uh, when you do, uh, you can know the greenness uh, from uh, optical data and also some of the uh, information about the the wood, the trunk uh, from uh, microsatellite like data. But uh, the problem is the, when you convert this greenness or, 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 or the, the, the trunk information to actual ground data, its accuracy is very, very low, around 0 0.4, 0 0.5 uh, uh, R square coefficient, something like that. So that was a serious problem. Then uh, one part of Nepal, we had some um, uh, LIDAR data and the height information. So the, when you bring the height information along with this other uh, greenness information, uh, uh, then your accuracy goes up drastically. So uh, from drone, you get the greenness of the uh, health of the vegetation as well as height. And you have few samples, some samples in the ground. You can do the biomass estimation very, very accurately, and which is very, very important for, for many, many industries. Uh, um, uh, and uh, probably uh, recently, I, I had a discussion uh, with a Japanese person. There's a very big company called Marugani, Japanese company. They have a large eucalyptus plantations in, uh, in Malaysia, which is, I think, uh, quite uh, 4,000 square, uh, 4,000 square kilometer hotel in the different places of, uh, of Malaysia. So they are also using drone to look at this biomass uh, estimation. And, uh, you know, the recently this kind of uh, plantation eucalyptus demand has been increased very high level. Uh, the main reason is because of this, uh, your e-commerce, this Amazon and others, all the packaging, all the packaging material uh, are uh, coming from, they're using uh, raw material uh, is eucalyptus. So that demand has gone drastically in recent years. So I think in India also now, e-commerce is picking up. I think this is one of the area where um, there, is a, there is a very big market. Next slide. Okay, so this is one case study uh, my colleagues has done in Thailand with Thailand, uh, one of the Rice Research Institute in Thailand. I'm a professor Singh will know it is uh, Oita Rice Research Center, which is around 30 kilometer north of AIT. And they have a control plot, 16 control plot, and uh, one Number one is no fertilizer, two to 11 is gradual increment, 12 is optimum fertilizer, and 13, 14, 15 is more fertilizer. So this is 10 meter by five meter uh, plots uh, where uh, we uh, jointly, they, I mean, uh, with our collaboration with them, they grow the rice and we fly drone uh, every uh, few days uh, to monitor the rice. Next slide. So uh, you can see the, the, this is a photo, uh, just a image, normal photo from drone and, uh, 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 and uh, the, the plots, uh, it's actually in the ground. Next slide. So the <clears throat> images were uh, collected uh, in each, each phase of rice, uh, I mean, all of them, uh, most of you know, uh, trans uh, transplanting, tillering, uh, and pinacolination, these are the rice and rice stages. And from transplanting up to uh, up to the flooding stage, this is the stage where we regularly, every 10, eight to 10 days, we get the, we fly the drone and see the uh, greenness index and DVI. If from transplanting up to the Flowering stage, if it is consistently green uh, or uh, green enough, you can expect uh, that this will give some uh, good yield. And in between, if there is a uh, some problem and your uh, greenness has gone and your NDVI, which I talk about, is goes down, it means it has some problem. It could be some pest, it could be some water stress, it could be something else. So then your it will affect your yield. So this is uh, this particular uh, 
uh, exercise we used uh, using satellite data. I did a project, a World Bank project in Uttar, Uttar Pradesh in 2013. And we, uh, uh, we uh, used satellite data using the same principle. Every eight days we uh, see the uh, rice, uh, um, rice status in uh, whole Uttar Pradesh. And beauty is that the moment you uh, take the last reading in the flowering stage, at that point of time, you can predict the yield. You don't have to really wait till it harvested. Because uh, uh, we have satellite, in case of satellite data, every year we have um, uh, this NDVI data uh, every 10 days. And we know the yield in last, say, this data, satellite data is available from 2001. So 2001 to 2019 data, we have satellite readings every 10 days. We have also production, rice production. So you can, make a regression equation. And the moment your this 2020 data come, uh, the, the, I mean, the, the, the greenness, the immediately you can put uh, your value in the regression and you will get the yield. The idea is that uh, it is uh, maybe not 100% correct, but at least I would say 80 plus, 80% 80 or plus, uh, depending on how much field work you have done, 80 to 90% correct at the before harvesting. And if you know the rice, uh, estimation of the country, say India, before harvesting, you know that how much rice is coming. And then you can take a decision how much, whether to import or export. Because at the time of harvesting, you know that in terms of price are uh, slow. But if you wait, then it might uh, go up. And so this is one of the good to We try to do the same thing using drone. And uh, next slide. So this is, you see, the right side is the, our plots. And uh, 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 left side, you can see up one, this red, red boundary. These are the grass, and you can see the signature. They are a little bit uh, uh, white or uh, light color than, than your eyes. So uh, uh, this is an experimental plot, but if you have a large garden, uh, large plantation, so this information could be useful. What are the other um, uh, other weed or other invasive species is coming up? Uh, so large scale plantation, it will be very, very useful. And left side down is the actual close photograph of our plots. Uh, next slide. Next slide, yeah. So this is the, basically the both images are, I'd say same, no, go, go, huh? oh, okay. Okay, so uh, if you look at this, uh, this um, uh, graph, left side upper, there is a, you see this uh, greenness index from uh, <clears throat> transplanting, it is going up and up, and this is the peak, then it is going down when lights start uh, ripening is becoming golden and it's going down. Uh, next, next slide. Next slide. Uh, okay. So this is the all these sixteen plots. We we try to we try to uh, plot every sixteen plots, and also <clears throat> um, uh, then uh, because uh, as you it's a control experiment, uh, different uh, inputs, and we try to see how things are changing in different plots according to inputs. Next slide. Okay. So this is the yield. Uh, down uh, x-axis is the, again, again the greenness. And you see greenness is increasing 0 0.828486 and the peak, it was 0.94, uh, 0 0.92. After that, we got the reading, then it started ripening and going down. And you can see the yield. Also, we have some yield data from past, uh, past uh, data. So uh, that, uh, this is the NDVI. And right hand is also NDRE. Uh, the left side, we are using two ch channels, red channels and infrared. So it's, I is infrared here, visitation infrared. And here, right side is...
right side instead of infrared we are using red edge it is the uh, in between red and infrared but uh, we try to see is there any difference because we, our camera that uh, sequoia camera that uh, multi spectral camera is the same uh, it has it has both the camera that's why we try to use this this uh, this one <clears throat> next slide okay so this is the one of the uh, drone we have uh, built by ourselves. So, um, uh, so far I have given a background and some of the applications. So this particular one, uh, I would like to request my colleague uh, Sasanka to explain how he built and because I think for agriculture engineers, it is very important that <clears throat> if we don't uh, 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 go to the new technologies, uh, I think um, uh, it will be very soon. It will this space will be occupied by the other electronic engineers or or, or uh, those kind of uh, people. Because uh, my experience in Pune, uh, when we organized the workshop, there are ten uh, startup companies came, uh, which is agriculture. Out of ten, only one person, the startup CEO, is agriculture background. Others are all electronic, computer science, and data this and that so i think it is important that we also uh, spend uh, uh, our uh, agriculture engineers fraternity they should take it very seriously need to be uh, changed uh, i mean put the, uh, this kind of electronics and things very uh, to the curriculum and uh, dr uh, said uh, he is always ad advocating this and uh, the uh, i am saying this uh, because None of us here, we are not electronic engineers, none of them. The person who developed, he's a surveyor, but he uh, went to the, uh, we got some guidance from one Japanese institution. Uh, the person who developed in Japan, he's an earthquake guy. So do it yourself, uh, having some idea, a little bit of, uh, all, everything is open source. Everything is freely available. You can buy all parts and you might do it yourself. I think this is a time we should, uh, 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 we should try to do this. So I will ask my colleague Sasanka. So, so yeah. yes, <clears throat> he is our staff here. And he is, as I said, basically surveyor from Sri Lanka. And uh, he will be uh, uh, Finishing his, uh, he worked how many years? Uh, five years. Five maybe. years, and in this uh, September, he is going to Netherlands for his master's degree in this area. So, over to Sasanka. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Mansur. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And good evening, everyone. So, good evening. Uh, I'm Sasanka, and I'm working in GIC as a researcher. So, I'm the uh, guy responsible for. Uh, building uh, this custom-made drones. So before introducing these drones, so I will uh, tell a story that why uh, we are building this kind of drones. So uh, there is an online platform to process the drone imagery. So they did a survey in 2019 about uh, what are the type of drones uh, people use to uh, uh, to be processed in their platform. So in that study, they have found out that around 90% of the drones people use are consumer grade drones. Consumer grade drones are basically like, uh, for example, you can say DJI drones, DJI Phantom series drone or Mavic series drone. So these consumer drones available to the people at low cost. So the uh, most of the processing data in their platform are coming from these drones. So one main reason for people to use the consumer grade drones for surveying. So these drones are not built for surveying, but it can be used. The one main reason is the survey grade drones are really expensive. So if you take an EB, so there, there, there is a one popular survey grade drone called EB, which can cover a large area and up to very high level of accuracy. And it costs around 25,000 US dollars. But when compared to a consumer grade drone, it 
just was around 2000 years ago so people are more uh, likely to use uh, consumer grade drones so disadvantage of the consumer grade drones is that of course it can map but the accuracy wise and the coverage wise the most important thing is the coverage so uh, if you take a consumer grade drone it can only fly up to 30 meet 30 minutes but if you take a survey grade drone it, it will cover a large area it can fly up to 90 minutes or even more even further so our idea is to build such kind of survey grade capable drone at low cost so that uh, that was the initiative so we started uh, building these drones at our center so so far the all the drones we have prepared are under 3000 us dollars and still we are achieving the same level of accuracy so dr hasarega clearly explained that uh, the uh, about the sensors we can use and the task of this drone is to act as a platform so it takes your sensor up in the air and uh, drone has to follow a certain path in order to capture your data so that is the task of this drone and as dr hasarega explained so all these parts you can buy online and the firmware we develop the base is open source so based on that uh, you can develop all the hardware and also all the firmware uh, are open source thank you sorry all right uh, so this slide it particularly so show a uh, uh, fixed wing drone we developed for long range mapping so we call it uh, fx 79 bear on that so it is also under 2000 us dollars uh, um, next slide yeah. okay so drone hardware if you take the drone hardware it has uh, several parts so first one is uh, the drone itself which is which can uh, consist of the fuselage and propulsion so propulsion will be a motor if you take a fixed wing drone there will be a thrust from one or two motors uh, to get the velocity and if you take a, a multi rotor the thrust will be directly uh, given upward and this drones control surface and the thrust are controlled by an autopilot so for our drones we are using an autopilot system called pixor it is one of uh, reliable open source uh, projects so uh, the hardware itself and the firmware running on uh, it's called ardu pilot and both are open source so for the sensors we can uh, integrate either rgb sensor so right now we are using an rgb sensor or we can integrate a multi spectral camera and all the data coming from the drone will be the geotag images for geotag uh, data so that will be processed in specific software so for, uh, call it we call it photogrammetric software and we can get uh, the products next, next slide, slide. Yeah. Uh, this this slide is about the uh, effect seventy nine Beirunda. So the you can see it in the uh, background. So it, it's hand hand launched by one of my colleague. And these are the specification of this drone. So if we compare this drone, uh, the drone's price with a, a commercially available survey grade drone. so so commercially available survey grade drone it has around uh, the price is around 25000 if you go for an sense wise eb but uh, this drone also has the same functionality and uh, acceptable level of accuracy but uh, it lies uh, in the range of a consumer grade drone so it is just we can build it around uh, 3000 us dollars and it has uh, quite a long range as well as uh, at good flying time so when it comes to surveying this uh, the range of the drone 
and the endurance it matters because uh, it defines how much area we can cover in a single flight so overall it uh, matters to the efficiency of our project yes. next slide and uh, this this is the overview of the system inside the fx 79 that uh, fixed wing drone so you can see in the middle uh, this is the flight controller so uh, this is the brain of the uh, drone so this controls everything and here we have the camera so this is a very high resolution sony camera and this is timely triggered by the pixo and we are using a positioning system here so gps this, yeah gps uh, gps system and battery is here and this is a motor control unit we call it esc and the other uh, electronics are beside the, the this part actually there are two components here so that that will be our transmitter and uh, the telemetry transmitter and the video transmitter so all these parts uh, these are the parts uh, which uh, are inside the uh, inside the fixed wing drone yeah next next slide okay so this uh, this is the uh, Uh, okay. figure overall figure of how the things are connected so these components are inside the drone so on the ground we have our ground control station so it is basically a receiver so here the all the drones telemetry data is transmitted by radio signal and we can receive that signal using a receiver and uh we can run our we, we run our ground control station software here and the control of the drone is done manually by a remote controller but when we are doing the surveying the, all the operation will be autonomous so this is just in case of emergency as well as for launching so after launching we switch it to the uh, autopilot so the drone sort of pilot system will take care of collecting the data as well as uh, um, flying the drone next slide so this is the uh, coverage that we can get uh, using our fixed wing drone so initially we tested with uh, two different camera systems so this is the very high resolution camera and uh, this gitap g2 pro is uh, is a wide angle camera so the amount of coverage we can get from one image is high so you can see here so this line corresponding to the uh, gitap gitap g2 camera and this is for the uh, sony rx100 camera so this is very high resolution camera if we are dealing with uh, a project which requires to make a uh, rapid map then we can go with this kind of uh, imaging system yes. next slide so uh, dr hasarika already mentioned that in order to make a map using drone we cannot uh, get the data randomly there is there is a specific way so this figure explains that a specific way so we call it a flight plan so drone has to fly in a way that it captures overlapping data so yeah in this figure it is explained if you take one image so next consecutive image has to overlap some of the area of the one image uh, in as a rule of thumb it will be 70% as, as well as the next flight line also has to overlap so this this is essential if you are doing mapping with a drone so the drone we have made are integrated with the uh, the flight planning uh, option also so we can uh, do the flight planning using our ground uh, control station and upload it to the drone so 
so with the flick of a switch we can uh, tell the drone to execute that mission autonomously next slide and this is the uh, a map product this is uh, the asian institute of technology the the institute uh, we are based on so this is one square kilometer the total area is around one square kilometer so this is uh, the map we have created using our fixed wing drone so if we compare it with a traditional or consumer grade drone normally a dji phantom uh, it will take around six flights but the drone we have built here it uh, only takes just one flight and within one hour uh, the whole area can be mapped next slide please and this is the elevation model so digital surface model uh, created using the images we capture next slide please and here is a quick comparison about the uh, features of uh, the custom made drone as well as the the compared to the other drones so the fx79 uh, the drone the price um, here uh, depending on uh, uh, also the camera and many other things yeah, yeah. yeah so it is a kind of you can always give a range of the price yeah sure so uh, i mean uh, initially we need uh, investment also capital investment as if we take only the parts it can be around uh, 3000 to 2000 dollars but uh, if we incorporate all the other factors such as the uh, amount of other equipments required so we need uh, some electronic work work stations to uh, build this drone so if we incorporate that cost also uh, we can say it is around the cost will be around 4000 us dollars and still you can see that uh, these last four drones these are uh, survey grade drones so no the average price of the survey grade drone uh, we can see it is it lies around 20000 us dollars but if you take a consumer drone it's around it range around 1500 us dollars so the drone we build here it only cost uh, when we compared it with the uh, survey grade drone it uh, cost a fraction and if you go for the accuracy so you can see that survey grade drones provide very high level of accuracy so eb ebx so this is uh, one of the most uh, uh, advanced survey grade drone made by sensefly and it has around 1.5 cm accuracy the accuracy of the drone we built here is around 34 cm less accurate than the commercially available survey grade drones but application besides the accuracy sometimes we need this kind of 1.5 cm accuracy so then we have to go with this kind of uh, uh, survey grade solutions but most of the general case scenarios the 34 cm accuracy is enough so in, if you take the agricultural monitoring for example we may not need a 1 or 2 cm accuracy uh, this level of accuracy might be enough for uh, our analysis also uh, just one point here is because we are also using not very high grade camera so if you um, buy very high quality camera photogrammetry then it it will improve further yeah. so this kind of mm -hmm. and also positioning system uh, the if you go for uh, the very cheap one maybe you can get 100 dollar if you go for the very uh, high accuracy which will, will cost you 1000 or 1500 dollar so depend it can be improved but you have to invest more yeah next slide next please. slide and this figure is important when when we take it for surveying or any uh, mapping mapping project because uh, 
uh, this indicates how much the drone can cover within a single flight. So you can see that uh, if if you fly around 120 meters, this uh, the our drone it can cover around 200 hectares. So quite a, a large number compared to the consumer drones, and it uh, lies in between com uh, consumer drones and the commercial uh, survey grade drones. So the next figure it explains the uh, one of the main difficulty in this. Uh, custom-made drones. So, operating a commercially available survey grade solution is relatively easy. But when we go for a DIY solution uh, with open source hardware and open source firmware, the operation complexity becomes very high. So, it, it, it becomes sophisticated. So, you need a uh, specific knowledge to operate this kind of drone safely. So, that is uh, one of the it's a limitation. Next slide, please. Okay. So, uh, sir, I think the video I did not send to you because it's very big size. Okay. Uh, I was uh, thinking that uh, I will uh, run from here. So that is, you cannot you are, run. Yeah. Uh, since uh, you are not going, so I think we will not. I run. can, I can, I can, I can give you the host. You have used uh, Zoom webinar. Have you used before? Uh, Zoom, uh, yeah, I have. Uh, we are using Zoom. Zoom webinar you have used. Okay. Uh, now uh, I would request you will get the screen sharing everything. Uh, Setu, can you make him host, please? Setu, can you make? Yeah. Yeah. Now you are the host. Now you can you can uh, uh, share your screen and you can oh, play the yeah, yeah. video. Yes. Can you see my? Yes, screen? yes, I can see. You go ahead. Full screen, you can make it if you want. Yes, you can run. Okay, so this is the one uh, which we uh, develop, uh, as you, you have explained just now. So this is test flight we did. So flight planning we do using uh, this is Ardu Pilot is an open source, completely open source, and you do the these are waypoints which uh, way it will it will it will move it will go. So before flying, you make this plan and you take it off. Okay, so it's gone. And oh, sorry, so, this is some camera, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, this is some uh, camera in the front we just put uh, This is not the uh, photograph uh, for photograph, just to see where, uh, where it is. So now you see, after initial uh, uh, initial takeoff, it will now follow the path which we have given. And this is an AIT football ground. Uh, we are uh, so now. One thing. So one of the problem with this drone is it needs huge a uh, long uh, long uh, uh, runway to to for for landing. So it was a problem. So we did something. Just you look at what we have done. You see. We put a parachute up there and it's vertically landing. Okay, so this is what uh, we have done. Uh, okay, so uh, then um, uh, also yeah, uh, the, uh, this is a uh, uh, fixing, and then this one we develop. Uh, we are under in the lab, uh, so uh, it is hybrid. You see these two lines here. There is a propeller, so this is as a quadcopter. I mean, like a multicopter. And this is plane. So going up, we can use this one. So yesterday we test flight just from our lab to lab, just to show you today. <laughs> it's going up. So once it go and take the attain the height, then we stop these four propellers, then we start the back propeller. Now it's going, moving forward. Very, very, very steep. Yeah, it's somewhere here, I think. Yeah. 
think I can call it a little bit now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not in the tree, right? <laughs> no, it's coming. So, it's a little bit noisy, I think, because of so many propellers, four propellers are there. Our cameraman was not good, I think. So not professional, maybe. <laughs> okay, London. Okay. That's it. Thank you very much. Any questions? And uh, comments? Oh, wait, wait. Uh, you can thank you very much. We'll talk. You stop sharing your screen first so that I can oh, come to the next. Okay. You stop sharing first. All right, all right. Just uh, stop sharing. What this In your screen. Uh, only stop sharing, you will click. Or, or okay, yeah, I will. Yeah, yeah. I will stop yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, okay, yes. I have done that. Now, uh, now I will explain you uh, question and answer. Those who are panelists, you we will start your video on, so you can raise your hand if you have questions. Those who are attendees, who cannot speak, the mic is broken. Sorry, my mic is blocked. So they can. There is a button there. They can see. Raise your hand. So as we will see it, then we call for the people to speak. Uh, first, give me a second to transfer it to the correct host. Professor Singh is raising hand. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, let me first thank him, then I will give it to Dr. Singh. I think, uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank Sasanka. Uh, you done an excellent job coming on today for all of us and uh, telling the exact, uh, uh, like the guy who, who, who has done the job. So it is a very I have to thank you very much for sparing your time. And uh, Manzil is uh, something, yesterday I told him and I told him I owe you something. Uh, he's a guy, great guy. He told, come on, it, it's my duty to do it. I mean, that type of person like Manzil, who, who is very uh, down to earth person. And I really appreciate, we all appreciate how much time you've taken to explain us point by point about what type of drones, because this would be useful, especially for the engineers who are coming out, agricultural engineers to understand the basic stuff to come. And that you've done a wonderful job. I think, uh, uh, again, I all will thank you. I give the time. But I think I'll ask uh, Dr. Gajan Singh to first. Uh, yes, uh, first of all, thank you, Manjul, uh, for giving this excellent seminar. Um, I think for information, you know, the Manjul, uh, Sayyad, and Ganos Gora are working as a team to help Rahuri uh, yes. to make use of this kind of technology and I'm very proud that uh, this team, the IT team, I should say, uh, uh, working hard. Now, I want uh, Dr. Mehta, CR Mehta and Indramani to think what kind of investment is required. And they should uh, consult with Manjul because they have a very small team. The whole AIT faculty is smaller than CIA Bhopal. Okay. <laughs> And we talk about AIT are, so many times. So I think uh, we are we online. We are online. Facebook. We are online in Facebook. Yes, we are so online please, on Facebook. So please uh, think about it, and you consult uh, Manjul. He has a very small team. Okay, uh, uh, it'll be a little. Uh, I think embarrassing to tell how few people they are and putting these uh, big things together. Okay, so this is my suggestion. The CIA Bhopal, being our lead institute, uh, should be thinking of putting uh, drones together for various uses in agricultural research. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sia Mehta, please. Dr. Sia Mehta. Yeah. Good evening, Good evening, everyone. So first of all, I thank Manjul Hajarika for very good and informative presentations. And I also thank Sasanka for developing such drones and showing their applications. And as suggested by Professor Gajendra Singh, we have already planned to work in this area. We have initiated work in some at some places in country. Even some centers of ACRIP on FIM has already started working in this area. But certainly, 
He has, he has provided information related to most of the area in which the drones can be applied. Even we are planning to planning to assess the yield of fruit trees also. So the drones can be applied there. And he has also shown application for counting of drones for tree plantations and other. So certainly we may like to even coordinate with them and we may like to take their help in our work. Our team is really young and they like to work in this area and we are motivating them. Even our council is also right now finalizing the policy for operation of drones in that DDG engineering is chairman of that committee and Dr. Indramani is member secretary of that committee and soon we are we will be in a position to finalize the policy for operation of drones. Dr. I think you should be fabricating them. Yes. Assemble them, fabricate in CIA. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, I think I think that's excellent suggestion because people try to import. That was one of the reasons why I started try to make this uh, uh, webinar is to promote our local guys can make yeah. it. And there is somebody trying in Pune. I think we should try. I think agricultural institute can do it. Hundred percent. There is yeah. enough people we have skills. Now come to the next one. I think uh, uh, questions. We are many questions are there. Uh, there is a doubt, so I will tell you the panelists. The panelists can see right hand side there is a raise hand if your video is off no problem you will see a raise hand a button a tab is there bottom most right in the panel participants when you see the panelist participant list you click on the participants otherwise you will see a list coming there and down you will see raise hand you press the raise hand then i can see you that you raise the hand then i can tell to rule now uh, first i would uh, like uh, dr narendra shah has raised the hand can narendra shah can you speak please yeah, can you hear me? Am I audible? Uh, all, all of us, all of us can hear you. I can see. I will tell you. Right. Us. Yeah. So uh, this is actually a question to Dr. Manjul that uh, uh, the uh, efficacy of uh, uh, monitoring, for example, the biomass systems, uh, is it scale dependent? What I'm trying to say is, let's say in the rice agronomy experiment, when you had the small 16 different plots. And you had you showed that you were your accuracy was something close to some 80 percent, 90 percent. But let's say if you take a large horticultural garden, let's say a uh, uh, Mosambi garden or orange garden, let me put it that way. Or or, or uh, so will the uh, uh, efficacy or the accuracy of uh, sort of estimation of let's say for example the fruit product uh, uh, estimation in a horticultural garden would that come down with a scale? Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> our work is so far we are uh, confined ourselves in rice, uh, in experimental as well as a large area, um, which is, uh, as I have shown to you, it is based on the, the greenness of the crop uh, within that uh, growing period of, say, uh, let's say, three months. Now, uh, if you look at, at the uh, horticultural crop, it will be perennial green, probably, uh, throughout. So um, I, uh, if there is, if we can establish some relationship between the greenness uh, and our, our biomass of the tree with the productivity, I think that is possible. Like if if we can um, find some empirical relationship or something like that. But other than that, uh, the most um, in the horticultural plantation or tea or coffee plantations, uh, I. Our idea is to, these are very large scale farm, uh, gardens and monitoring that uh, if some uh, pest attack is there or some water stress is there, manually large garden, and, and you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, uh, have a uh, car or something inside the garden. You have to go by bicycle or walking, which takes a lot of time. So I think that kind of thing, it will be very, very useful. And currently we are, uh, submitting a World Bank proposal in Vietnam to fly drone for monitoring coffee. So I don't know if it is come up, uh, if we win, then maybe we'll be doing some survey in Vietnam in next uh, two months time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, next question we have from Dr. Gandhi Murthy, please. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sayed. Uh, thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Hazarika. Uh, so I had a very specific technical question in the sense that when you showed the 16 uh, plots for the different rice varieties, they all had different responses in terms of the NDVI, uh, basically. Uh, so my question was, now that 
for a large country like India, we know that we'll be having different varieties of rice in different small scale fields. Is it possible to estimate the yield because the yield is dependent on those NDVI values and that correlations there, and it is varietal uh, specific variety dependent? Is it possible to estimate the yields uh, for different varieties? Or basically, my uh, further question is: Is it possible to extract the uh, varietal or the uh, varietal uh, information from those NDVI values. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. So uh, actually, honestly speaking, we have successfully done this one, as I mentioned, to Uttar Pradesh, all Uttar Pradesh, we, we, we did using satellite data. And we are trying to replicate the same in a very small plots. But uh, the if you look at the whole, uh, I mean, the framework, my idea is that we regularly monitor the rice, uh, uh, say, uh, one uh, state uh, or few states, uh, because we are getting free satellite data, 250 meter resolution, cloud free every eight days. Okay. So this satellite okay. data we okay. use and we get this uh, NDVI. And if there is some pockets, we see some problem. And the way there we can try drone to see exactly what is happening in those areas. Not really ill estimation we can use that drone. But having said that, uh, you uh, your earlier question about the different variety of price and our other things. Yes, I agree. Uh, what we have found in Uttar, Uttar Pradesh is NDVI in two different locations, same NDVI, but different in. Reason is uh, because of the rice variety is different, their um, uh, environmental condition is different, soil is different. So um, uh, the best way what we did is we, we make yield model for different location, different yield model, and then we estimate the rice uh, yield. Then we combine together. So uh, uh, that will, uh, although as I said, uh, NDVI is uh, is uh, the same, but uh, uh, the, the yield is different. So uh, we uh, we can uh, do one thing. Uh, this um, the, one of the problem is uh, to get the uh, uh, for our satellite data, two fifty meter by two fifty meter cell, we can produce the uh, the, the, the yield, but. Uh, because we are making a regression equation, so the minimum size of the yield in the uh, in, in the in, a, in a, some uh, sub district level yield, if we can get, then we can develop several uh, yield models so depending on the location uh, or local knowledge. Then I think that will be much more better. But still, I can share the results with the Uttar Pradesh. It's quite promising, I would say. Thank you. Uh, we'll take the next question. Uh, we have two, three questions. I'll allow another two questions. There was the next speaker ready. So I'll, uh, uh, can you please enable Digvijay Wakare to speak, please? Setu? Uh, uh, Mr. Digvijay Wakare, can, you can speak now. We can hear. Mr. Digvijay? Hello, sir. Could you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear. Tell the question. Good evening, all. Sir, I am a BTEC agree second year student. Okay. I, I would likely request you or ask you that what are the criteria or what are the experiments undertaken to, for drone mapping for which we are mis, we, we are interested in studying and what are the opportunities for now during a graduation level? Thank you. First of all, I will I'll answer in sort of Zarika. I think you are second year BTEC. I think there is a long way to go. Now, Dr. Azarika, please. Uh, I think, uh, see, I mean, uh, only thing what I can do is that uh, when I was in Pune uh, last uh, two, three times, um, there is a very big drone company in Pune, it's called IAM. And uh, our World Bank project, uh, they purchase drone drones from them. And, uh, uh, and I visited their factory, in fact, it's a very large factory, a lot of drones are being produced. But as I said, in India, these drones are not allowed uh, to uh, operate commercially. They are uh, selling the drones to defense sector, uh, 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 Indian military. And uh, when they um, uh, demonstrate their drones, like they have developed some spraying drones, okay? And uh, then I asked uh, about them, how you are using uh, for how much to spray 
for different crops uh, 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 for di uh, and depending on the height of the crops and, uh, or other parameters, how you are doing it. He, he said, that, no, we don't have any idea about this. We are just putting the nozzles and we are applying. So they need, they need some knowledgeable person. Okay. So this computer science in electronics, they can make the system, but they don't know about the rate and how uh, about the uh, how they can okay. apply. So they say to me that they are looking for good agricultural engineer to help them. And they are willing to take them in their company, but provided our engineers should have this kind of knowledge or experience. I okay. think if, just, if this kind of curriculum within the agricultural engineering, or is the, I think market is very uh, willing, they will yeah. take us uh, very easily. Yeah. That's why I'm very much confident about that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Sorry Thank to you. interrupt you, sir. Are, no, no, please, please, please. Oh. Uh, uh, because I think the time is over because we already next speaker is there. We have uh, time here to keep. And you all know how to be uh, getting, uh, uh, to get connected with uh, Dr. Manzula Zarika. Any questions or to IAC directly you can contact. We'll again arrange certain ones. Uh, again, the program. Now we have to go to the second speaker. Now I would like uh, Dr. Indramani, you want to say something now? Yeah, actually, very briefly, I want to intervene that. Uh, uh, this uh, drone project, uh, basically, there is a committee from uh, Government of India side, because Dr. Hajarka is mentioning many times about uh, regulations, so there was there is no regulation as such, uh, uh, we can't fly drone, uh, uh, so our agriculture purpose, so Government of India made a committee under Dr. Uh, Alagu Sundaram, and uh, this concern was taken into account, uh, we contacted some manufacturers also who are in the drone manufacturing uh, line and uh, a team was uh, made uh, which included uh, entomologist pathologist and uh, agronomist and engineers and uh, we conducted uh, experiments in uh, uh, some part of uh, haryana at some locations for uh, small uh, crop like uh, paddy then going to uh, sugarcane and finally fruit trees and we have come out with some data. We prepared the report. Report has been submitted and presented. And very soon, uh, we will have uh, uh, re this regulation for uh, uh, drone application in agriculture. This one part I wanted to add. And uh, Dr. Dr. Alagu Sundaram Sahib is chairman. I'm convener of the committee. And all these people are there. So this one, uh, one part will be taken care of. Then uh, ICR, uh, Agriculture and Engineering Division, uh, they uh, sanctioned some project uh, on drone and one at IE. And uh, so we have, uh, you know, we have started work on that and processing as suggested. I was discussing with my team members who are uh, here on the webinar and uh, uh, we will be having definitely, you know, uh, all these applications which Dr. Hazarika has mentioned here. We will try to take it up in collaboration with the uh, you know CIAE and other uh, ag engineering institutions. And I'm I'm really very much encouraged that uh, we will be having uh, this drone technology for different applications uh, uh, soon in India, and we will collaborate with industry. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Idrabani, for the reply. We will go to the next speaker. Um, I would introduce uh, next speaker. It's Mr. A.P. Ramachandran. He, is, uh, he was my classmate also in uh, Bachelors. And uh, he has actually, after finishing, he is the first guy to start in uh, computer software business in 1983. And uh, he's one of the major IT, ITS, BPO player in Coimbatore. So he was in IT industry. Before that, he was also, uh, he made a syllabus for the plus two also. So his question is, uh, then he has been into IT park, the first IT park in Coimbatore he started, and first tie up with IBM mainframe, everything. But basically, he's also a farmer, he's also an agriculture engineer. And he is now into venture of really modernizing the agriculture. If when he will talk, I will talk about agriculture part. Let him talk what he has done, what his problems, what are the challenges, and what he recommends to all the youngsters to come. Uh, AP Ramachandran, please. Yeah, thanks, uh, Syed. Uh, thanks for introducing. Hope uh, your uh, my voice is clear. Very clear. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, see, basically, uh, to all the panelists and the participants, 
I'm a little different guy. I'm not an academician or I'm not a researcher. I'm a basically a businessman. Okay. And how I, I just want to explain uh, how a businessman looks at automation uh, in any field, whatever it is, it's today it's agriculture. So any field, how is going, the person is going to uh, look. So when we, uh, we were being uh, from 1983, 84, we have been in IT software and ITS, BPO and all that. So when 2013, 14, we, our family decided to diversify into agriculture. The first point we, we thought how a daily operation can be automated. And when we look for a technology availability and the process availability and the market, it's, we, we find it very, very difficult. It was just not available as what we want. And uh, one or two MNC companies were available, but the pricing part was very, very exhausted. It's almost um, 30, 40 lakhs uh, for a thing with the AMC and other things where a normal farmer cannot afford to go for a, uh, such a uh, um, facilities. So the first uh, thing, I'll, I'll just combine uh, how we have, we have graduated, how we, uh, we have grown uh, and stage by stage. The first stage when we said, many, many people suggested, are you interested in organic or are you interested in organic and your soil is getting uh, bad and how you are going to uh, do and how, <coughs> whether you are going to use a chemical and non-chemicals. So many, many things came in. So when, when we said, okay, how uh, we are going to do the, the one first point we, we come to understand that <coughs> in most of the agriculture, whether it is a flooded irrigation, the fertigation is done on a broadcasting and it is done on a weekly basis or once in a uh, fortnight. And even on a drip irrigation, the fatigation is done on a weekly basis. So one uh, I thought came in, we have, we have related a human being unto a plant. And <clears throat> for example, a human being, this is what we work. A human being required 800 kilocalories a day and are two to three liters of water a day. So if I bring in 20, 25 liters a can of a water, and 8,000 kilocalories of uh, excellent food and make you to eat uh, within two, three hours and consume everything, whatever it is available on the table. And next 10 days, nothing is available. So this is what it was. And almost 99, 100% of the people, whatever the way, whether it is a broadcast, uh, whether it's a flood irrigation or whether it is a Trip irrigation, this is what happening. So this, the chemical applications, your fertilizers, all that, the unutilized portions were going into the soil and the soil becomes bad. <coughs> so we thought the fertilizer and the water has to be given on the right time, the right quantity and the right place. Then how to do that? So that is where we started our automation. So, when we say the fatigation, so I, I, we have just taken the inorganic, organic on the side, because that's a, that's a chemical, non-chemical, and how to do that. So when we started analyzing, okay, I'm, I'm here uh, to give a water or a fertilizer or whatever it is for the plant at the right time and the right place and the right quantity, we have used a lot of uh, uh, automations and embedded softwares and to feed the water and the fertilizers. So when we did that, we analyzed what are the fertilizers available, whether it is a chemical fertilizers, where it is like, uh, I, can, I can even treat on a medicine, medical toe, you are, you are given a syrup or a tablets you just eat, it goes into your digestion system. It, after the digestion, it gets into your blood and it, you, you are get purified. 
and the other one is the intravenous direct to the blood so we started using the amino acid based fertilizers where it is a soluble and it is directly goes into the as a input to that for example if i take a urea it is it goes into the soil gets converted into the plant capabilities or absorption then it goes into the plant system whereas if you use the amino acids so it becomes automatically a non chemical concept so this is the first level of uh, um, uh, methods we used and we have used lot of uh, things how to uh, thing and we have uh, seven pumps um, vijay can you just show me the small pumps the last uh, last but one no, no, next you no you have to tell us next next slide only will come no this is one, a, don't have no, a, no. No, it will go one by one only. You tell no, me which side. Only the that's last right. point. I just wanted to show what are the facilities we are using. No. Uh, the one last but one. The the pumps what we are using for the for like fertigation pumps. The small seven pumps. Yeah. Go the ahead next, again. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, this yeah, is what. Stop there. So, the, the the previous one. Go back. One. Yeah, go back. so these are the uh, yeah these are the pumps uh, we use and way we pump in 5 ml to 500 ml per hour because uh, the logic is we use 50 ppm to 150 to 175 ppm fertigation to all mixed like uh, your uh, nitrogen phosphate and potash and micronutrient and all that mixed together we use around Uh, 50 uh, ppm to 150 to 175 ppm. So each pump has to pump in 5 ml to uh, 50 ml per hour to mix into the water. Then the major uh, thing came in when we started uh, pumping on a, from these small uh, pumps. Uh, when when a water is pumped from the well or a tank, it comes on a 5 kg to 6 kg pressure. and with a delivery rate of almost 42 50000 liters per hour and when the small quantity goes into that it then it then it, it uh, mixed to that so many people suggested okay you need another uh, 5 hp or a 10 hp motor where it is you mix all this uh, thing and pump into that so it adds to the system like a venturi system because normally we use a venturi system but here the venturi is one single uh, delivery here i am i am delivering almost six seven things because we are using um, panchagavya we are using amino acids in different forms so all that seven uh, items we are adding into that so we find it difficult so then one of my uh, friend uh, a yeah, liquid um, flow meters he said okay you are you are pumping uh, Uh, in a in a pipe of uh, four inch or a five inch pipe, so increase uh, your pipe size to eight inch for a uh, two to two to three uh, feet, so that a pressure drop will happen. So when you add with a pressure drop to these items, it get automatically things because I see one major point in agriculture power availability. You don't have a power; it's a zero power. You whatever the automation systems you plan you think you think for a, how to reduce my power without power how i my automation will work so that's a major uh, item we, we have to keep in mind whenever you are doing for agriculture so because of power and the major thing is it's a agriculture feeder agriculture feeder the power stability is very very you you can't have a stable power you, you get about 280 volt to 400 volt so and again uh, three phase you very rarely get to three phase always most of the times you get a two phase uh, lights so these are the constraint when you use on the lab and the uh, testing point and to the field level so we have overcome all these things we took a long time we have overcome all these things and now for us the embedded system now we are converting to a plc the embedded system is fine and we are able to do all that so when when it happens we thought okay the soil has got some ph 
my water and adding to this fertilizer has got some pH. So when both mixes can we make it neutralized at least 6.5 to 7.5 nearest to the uh, neutral. So we took uh, sensors, get back the uh, results, pH results and using uh, pH results after mixing all that uh, fertilizers and other things, it recognizes what is that when, when it goes into the soil, mixes with the soil, what is that uh, pH you get. So it depends on that, we add uh, alkaline and acid so that it, when it goes into the soil and mixes with the soil, it is almost nearest to the pH. So this is the exercise we have done. And uh, on this exercise, we have, we have found a lot of interesting uh, stories. Like when we are using sensors, we are not able to take uh, cables and the wires for a long distance. So we used Wi-Fi systems. And Wi-Fi systems, first two, three months, it went very well. And all of a sudden, it, uh, on a day, it went bad or it, 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 uh, signals were dropping. We, we are just not able to identify what are the problems it came. Then we identified, because that was a sugarcane uh, field, when the sugarcane grows very well, the plantation uh, density uh, becomes very big, the signals got blocked. And I, we are able to get only 30% level signals where the system doesn't work properly. So now we have, we have changed that also because the pH of uh, soil doesn't change every day. So what we thought, okay, every month we we'll take a sample, we analyze the pH and that pH we have transferred to a database so when that particular wall, that particular field, when it goes, that takes the pH from the database and the pH the all the uh, mixers uh, take and it adds a uh, alkaline or acid. So these are the tremendous, uh, um, what do you call, redo and redo and get and why it is not working, all that. So this is what uh, we have been, uh, the first level of uh, automation we have achieved. Okay, I, I'm applying my water and the fertigation where it doesn't mix with the soil or the excess. Uh, uh, there is no question of excess fertigation which goes into the soil or the fertigation goes into the soil and the soil gets convert, converts the fertilizer for the intake of the plant. So what we, we said, okay, we'll... We now have amino acids where it is like intravenous. It directly goes into that and it is soluble with the water. And when it actually goes and whatever the water goes into the plant, the plantation also, the fertigation also goes into that. So that is the first level of uh, automation we have reached. Then the second level is the pest and disease management. So that is where your, your uh, chemicals and all that comes in. So how to uh, avoid uh, pest and disease management? Disease management comparatively is simple because you have, a, if you select your seedling a proper way and you make the base soil in a comfortable way without uh, nematodes and other things. And the stamina, because it is on a daily basis, like what we take uh, breakfast and lunch and dinner, it is, it is done on a three uh, dosages. The water and the fatigation is done on a three uh, dosages, like a breakfast, day, lunch, and dinner. So automatically the stamina of the plant improves. When the stamina of the plant improves, the diseases doesn't come or the plants has resistance to withhold or uh, come out with the diseases. Then the major uh, thing came in the pest management. So the pest management, we have, a, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, through agriculture process, we have controlled a lot. That is agriculture process, like a repellent and uh, different crops, where uh, if I grow uh, banana, I grow some flowers. Okay. Uh, so it, yeah. So it, it, uh, it uh, repellent the, uh, what do you call, pest, or I, we can see, uh, the pest uh, attacks or uh, uh, things so that it is easy for us to control. And um, 
So how to avoid the chemical spraying? Because the major uh, in agriculture today, what we are talking about the uh, organic, inorganic is mainly three things, the pesticide, insecticide, and the weedicide. So the fertilizer even, it gets converted or soil gets bad. And your final product doesn't uh, get affected. But the final product is a chemical is only on the pest and disease management spraying and the weedicide spraying. So what, how to avoid? In an open system, we find it very, very difficult for the pest management, though we have uh, traps, light traps and all that. So we thought, okay, to overcome all that and again, yeah, natural because sometimes uh, the rain comes on an off season, the wind is in a different season. So can we avoid all that to to overcome the natural uh, phenomena and natural things, how to handle that. So we decided finally, okay, can we go for a controlled environment? This is how we have, we have just moved from a open uh, cultivation, yeah, automation for a fertigation and the irrigation, controlling the whole thing and uh, pest management and the disease management. Then we thought, okay, can we go for a, uh, what do you call, um, controlled environment where uh, the polyhouse, greenhouse and net house, all different uh, types are available. So we have, we have selected uh, polyhouse for uh, almost eight to nine acres. That's a very huge uh, thing for any uh, people. Many people have said, you are, you are going uh, too much. But we said, okay, we, we want to uh, do agriculture and industry because from the software side, we, we know what is industry for and we have expertise on the industry for. Can we, can we at least do something the industry, uh, at least not 100% industry for, can we do something to reach to that level for uh, the agriculture as an industry? That's, that's a mindset we, we thought we will go for that. So when we decided for a polyhouse, the major issues are control, uh, temperature control and humidity control because outside is nature. You don't have any temperature control. If the if sun shines, it's a more on heat. If it is a rain, it is a more on rain. If it is a wind, it's more. But in uh, polyos, you can control everything. You can control the sunshine. You can control the wind is totally zero and you can control the pest and the disease going. But one thing is, if by bad luck, even a small pest or a small uh, components goes into the polyhouse, because it's a controlled environment, as the crop is grown very well, the pest also grow very well. So you, you have to be very, very careful in uh, entry points and all that into the polyhouse so that there is no uh, pest or a con any, any of the uh, parts goes into the polyhouse. So when, when we went, uh, when we decided, the, the one thing is the temperature and the RH control. How to do the RH control? The normal uh, polyhouse, the industry polyhouse, everybody puts a fogus. The fogus, because we, we just went for the fogus on the first time, and the fogus, we found the major uh, thing, the pressures from the water uh, line. Because the agricultural feeder, we don't get a standard voltage. It varies from 280 to 400. So sometimes we get a very good pressure, the fogging will happen. Sometimes the fogging will not happen. In that time, yeah, water drops will happen. When the water drops happens, it's a havoc. Because when, when the flowering stage, when the water drops happens, the entire flower about. So you have an ab abortion of entire flowering. So the whole uh, uh, yield is zero. And all the type of diseases will come because the water stays on the leaves and other things. You have a, uh, all the virus diseases and all that comes. So we had a very, very tough time how to overcome all these things because it's a very, very difficult or you need a generator where you can't have a uh, cost uh, consideration. Then we decided, okay, can we go for a humidifier? Though it is a little uh, costly and a little power driven, <coughs> we thought, okay, it's a, it's a good 
to have a humidifier and we went for a humidifier and that saves the whole uh, issues and we don't have a fogs now we have a total humidifiers and that spreads the temperature where we have tremendous control on a humidification and the temperature so it's so all the sensors are there so it's automatic so one one, one clarification one clarification sorry to interrupt one clarification uh, uh, actually i want to uh, remind you that uh, uh, ramachandran is sitting at home he doesn't have the problem with laptops and all so he cannot show the control systems and uh, other humidity control so those who ask me about this i think he will continue if mine only now and yeah. he will i will request him to show the rest of the slides control a little bit idea what other slides at the end of it please yeah. come and continue please yeah. so so we have used a humidifier and humidifier with the industrial fans so get the uh, cool air throw into the because the for uh, each uh, polyos is one acre 4000 square meter so it's a size of 100 by 40 uh, meters so 100 by 40 meters uh, locating a uh, humidify itself was a big exercise where to locate how to locate how to spread the the cool air i can't have a 15 16 humidifier to get the uh, thing because my uh, cost the power availability then the how to minimize my power requirement all that it's it's a major thing keeping that we we have uh, thing and we what we have used we have used a very minimum 3 uh, to 4 humidifier and with the 5 to 6 uh, hp uh, power and used industrial fans to push the air into the corners and the, all the sudden things so when that happens when the humidifier and other things the crop and with the uh, the right time and the right uh, quantity of the fertigation and the things the crop yield and the crop things were okay but still we find the best moment because when a person moves from one field to the other field the workers moves and the staff moves the uh, supervisors moves from one field to other field a small particle virus uh, like a white fly and other things where you you just can't even identify how it goes only when it grows you, you can identify into the field so how to grow and uh, as we are doing this one of my friend in coimbatore is uh, manufacturing uh, ozone generators so he said uh, one of the system he delivered to netherland uh, for a fruit uh, cultivation and they add the ozone into the water for the irrigation so we thought okay can we try that and uh, we tried that uh, keeping the uh, ozone generator put into the venturi into the water line and it gave us a excellent uh, results nematodes were totally it becomes zero we didn't have any nematode uh, issues it becomes zero but the whole problem is like it's like a line of control if you excess ozone it affects the uh, roots root zone if it is a uh, low it uh, your nematodes is not uh, fully controlled so it becomes a little and again the the adding point of your ozone uh, air to the delivery point it should be less than 50 50 60 meters if it is more than 50 60 meters the ozone effect goes out so then we said okay can we use this into the air in the polyos so from the uh, humidifier and the industrial fan on the flow points we just added uh, we have just put the pipes of uh, gas pipes of the ozone generator where the ozone is just spread onto the entire uh, field or uh, thousand shed the entire shed it's it's a spread so you you'll be tremendous effort almost my pest control is zero we are, we are not spending any any chemical or any spray or anything for a pest because it's now totally controlled from the ozone so whenever the humidifier runs the ozone runs and uh, it's it's a sensor controlled it automatically runs the ozone goes into that and with the ozone 
it kills it because it's an extra oxygen O3, and the O3 adds into the things, the minor uh, things goes into it, and uh, it just gets killed. So this is this is the uh, levels we have done, and there were many many challenges we found. Though we are a businessman, we we couldn't uh, find because it's a research. Though as a business and when, when any business we do, we know what we are going to do and what's the time frame, whether it's a three months or a six months or a maximum one year. We finish our uh, uh, either a factory or a start running up and run. But here it's a total R&D research. Every day is a research. Even, even today we are doing a research. It's not a full-fledged. I cannot say it is 100% means in thorough. Every day we are on a research, some, something comes, something, because it's, there was no data available. Ram Ramachandran, another two minutes, please. Okay, I, I'll finish. Yes. So we, uh, there was, uh, funding was a big issue because though we have a lot of contacts from VC funding and other things, for agriculture, India is not allowed uh, foreign FDIs and other things or VC funding because the agriculture is, and we cannot show this as a separate company or a development and other things. So, and uh, that's a major thing. And the next point, we we are, uh, today, any polyhouse or a greenhouse, you go, there are only few uh, crops available, like your um, cucumber, capsicum, and tomato, because it's a non-pollination uh, products. The, it's a monopolization. It's all the flowers are female flowers. But when you, we want to grow all types of vegetables and we have used the wind inside uh, the fans which generates and the humidifier which generates. So that we have used as a ball for the pollination and we have uh, successfully done uh, crops uh, like uh, vegetable crops like um, bitter gods, uh, and um, Brinjal, Bendy, and all that. Now we are uh, moving towards non vegetable uh, crops like a sugarcane, turmeric, and uh, Murungai leaves and curry leaves. Where for sugarcane, we are already discussing with uh, Sugarcane Breeding Institute and uh, Banarium and Sugars, where it's a local uh, sugar mill. And for a sugar uh, sugarcane institute for the technical support for the sugar uh, growth and uh, sugarcane growth, and as a uh, using the thing, and just for uh, information, when we when we uh, as the discussion uh, progressed, uh, the director of sugar uh, sugar institute of uh, sugar institute told, as of today, there was no uh, sugar uh, grow sugarcane growth in the polyols, so it will be a uh, number one in the whole of uh, thing. So I'm, we are working uh, just because of the uh, COVID-19, this uh, issues, it just stopped. Maybe once it's over, we'll be signing a official uh, thing with the Sugarcane Breeding Institute and the Banarium and Sugars. We're bringing, and similarly, we are trying for a um, turmeric and banana and murungai leaf and curry leaf and all that because the vegetable market is fluctuating market. And here we need to get a minimum uh, things. And the next level, we thought, okay, why using one level of a soil? Can we use a multi-level? So like uh, your uh, uh, flats, can we have uh, five floors, eight floors, seven floors like that? So already my experiments were started. There we have a soil-based multi-levels and non-soil based multilevels. Non-soil based multilevels, there are a few uh, people, my own friends and others are working here like aerophonics and other things. I'm just waiting for their success, 100% success, whether it's aware I can, we can use that, uh, adopt the technology as it is. But soil based uh, multilevels, we, have, we, have, we don't have a much uh, people for a variety of uh, crops. So we are trying to go that. That means in one acre, can I take 10 acres, 15 acres multiplication? Because the one advantage in a polyos, in normal, for example, turmeric, in a normal thing, you go for a 10,000 seeds. Where 
Whereas in Apollos, we go for about 1,000 seats. So it's, it's a, even a seedling, we increase, uh, the spacing is uh, reduced, even the space things is reduced. So you have multiple uh, growth, multiple yield, and whereby reducing the cost and other things. So maybe by 2021, we are expecting uh, agriculture four, industry, like industry four, I'm, I'm just visualizing, can we bring in agriculture four as a total automation and uh, do that. So I have a few slides, which are my photos of my polyoses, uh, which I can just uh, one by one, you can just move. Yeah, do. So to go to from top and come down one by one, please. Yeah, one by one. It's all. Yeah, top you go first. First slide. It's all. Yeah. Yeah. It's all uh, polyos, and the, in the polyos normally it's about eight to ten feet, but we go for a fourteen feet so that a yeah, multi level we can do for a multi level. This is all of course a capsicum, cucumber, and all that essential days. And uh, these are the uh, ICs top, and uh, uh, top the slide. All that uh, view for uh, uh, systems and uh, how we have built. We have just to build many, many numbers finally to reach because absolutely there's no data available. It's all uh, trial and error. We achieved all these things. And finally today, yes, we have we have some knowledge. I can't say it's so we have we have any very knowledge, but we have some knowledge. And we can definitely support anybody. Uh, and uh, any, any persons. Ramchandra, time is uh, up. We have to close in another okay. few minutes. Yeah, yeah sure. Thanks, uh, Syed. Thanks for the yeah. all the people. Any any information or anything needed, I'm I'm available on my email and the phone. Thank you. Thank you. It's a very interesting topic from a, a businessman, and uh, who who is want to make and agriculture as a business and we heard his problem uh, one he told about the wi-fi didn't work that's a very simple it has to put in the height so the question is what the training is about to learn different technologies in communication it's very important second one uh, what you're talking about the precision agriculture we don't have enough suppliers when i talk to universities or professors they say we have done that we have done that when i go to field i can't find and at least he is doing, I have seen, and I think here I have, in this uh, panelist, two people have visited his farm and seen it working that's before one year. So I would now ask short questions. I will leave it to Indramani now. Any questions, how we go about it? And we, there are questions, or a lot of people have asked me about drones. They want to have a lot of questions they have. I think, Dr. Indramani, you have to guide how to go because time is short now. Yes, uh, I request the, you know, uh, participants that uh, please uh, just share your uh, questions. We will uh, share the email ID of uh, uh, Manjul and uh, that are, are even uh, we can write to him and get the answer because we would like to even compile those questions and answers. Uh, uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, okay. Doctor, Doctor Jha wants yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah Doctor Jha, please. please. Yeah, yeah, doctor, I have I have some observations. Yes. Actually, in the first uh, yeah. presentation by Dr. Manjul and his team was excellent, very good. And he has uh, presented about the drones applications. But uh, here, what we feel that we are lacking in the capacity buildings. As you have told that our syllabus and other things are not updated up to so much. So can Manjul and his team or any other person can give some trainings to some our scientists or some budding students, PhD students for design and fabrications of drones itself. Because yes. here you have just, you have bought the drone and the equipped with the equipment and sensor and all the camera, then analysis part is major job here. Only oh. taking the picture by the drone is not important. Important is analysis part and taking the result to the field. So that analysis also chemometrics and all the image analysis required excessive training to our manpower. Yeah. So if someone is yeah. giving them, then we can send yes. them to the yes. I, from HCR side. Sir, sir, can I? Yeah, Dr. Ja, ja, 
yeah yeah you can answer manzul but i would yeah. add, but before that i will tell before that i will tell i think the uh, software and all manzul has already demonstrated it's all open source stuff the problem what we are having in india is when you buy the drones the people who are using not educated about even electronics basic manzul also mentioned so, so the whole, that, whole that, i will complete i will complete we are doing that's the reason this whole webinar started so we will continue this we make a proposal already we have given the syllabus already what electronic knowledge is required that's what you think okay. now dr manzul please manzul please thank you very much for your question actually we started uh, capacity building in drones in india indian students so uh, we are in rahuri they have this and 20 students here so they were with us one month on uh, drones as well as google okay. Earth. second batch uh, from junagar eagles university they came also so I think uh, these are all World Bank, that national uh, NH, uh, the higher education project of ICR under that. They have on the cost. Uh, uh, cost, yes. That, that is a very uh, small and general type of training. I want uh, the training for development of fabrication facilities yeah. in India. That no, no, have first to of all, we have to, be, yeah, we have, we have to have a team. Thank you. This cannot, be, this cannot be discussed in this forum. Yeah. Dr. Bajan Singh, any idea? Because this cannot be discussed in this forum. Because yes. this has to be done from ICR and the people who are required, they have to discuss because this is an open forum. Everybody is listening, uh, is on uh, Facebook, it's also on. So, but we will do, I think we found the need for it to do. Good. Now, yeah, any good. other, uh, Dr. Gajan Singh, you want to uh, conclude with some of your remarks, please? Well, I, I think uh, I, I like the today's format, excellent uh, format in a way that very practical approach uh, on the problem and the solutions uh, shown like uh, demonstrating uh, rice yield monitoring for UP, which is such a complex uh, state, uh, small farmers and all that in a huge area. And uh, if that technology has been successfully used to, for yield estimation, I think it can be applied for the whole country uh, with the same uh, approach for different crops. And that will give us a really a edge as an agriculture engineer, if we really get into these technology. Fabrication, I already mentioned in the previous session that I think CIA and IERI or any other institute should take a lead in uh, coming out with the solutions uh, custom made, what is needed for different experiment, different research farms. Uh, I think Mr. Ramchandran is really an uh, ideal example of a researcher. Yeah, I'm fascinated that he uh, is doing what uh, we expect water technology center at IERI with a Absolutely. huge investment. And uh, similarly, CIA also has a small setup, but they, with the irrigation drainage engineering group, they can expand quite a bit. What I was, I did my work in the 1986 at Rutgers University on drip. And basic thing was when to apply, which nutrient in what quantity. Nobody in horticulture was able to tell me when to apply, how much is needed. Because Ramchandran pointed out very good message, plant like human being need food every day. It need food, nutrition and water every day. So you should think of applying it on every day as it is needed. So if we can reuse that approach and work, uh, modify our research programs at uh, uh, ICR institutes, I think it will go a long way. And Thank you. Uh, Thank you. That. Please, Thank please, you, don't please don't interrupt. Please don't interrupt. Please don't interrupt. Please don't interrupt. Yeah, go ahead, please. Professor Singh. No, yes, I, I'm done. I think I will okay. again congratulate okay. all of now, you. Actually, yeah, actually uh, when I called uh, Manzul yesterday, as well as today morning, actually, Ram Chidran, he doesn't have a laptop. He doesn't have any pictures. He's broke down. Because of lockdown, he cannot get out. So we managed somehow this much. He has, because he was, uh, he is really keen, interested to come out. And he's an example for us. Uh, what this new engineers, what we have to do in electronics. You recall Ramachandran is not, he's not studied electronics. Okay, but you try with his friend. So what I'm trying telling is, if you youngsters can learn a little bit of electronics, how much you will come up. And with this few words, I think the time is up. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, give any questions. Now, there is a, we have sent a questionnaire form to you. You can Google form is there. You can click and give your response in that. So then we can respond to all of you with the email. Uh, of the whatever requirement you have. Okay, with that, uh, I think Indramani, I think we'll close the session today.
what do you think you want to say something dr indramani uh, thank you just just one minute uh, you know uh, their questions actually people are asking just uh, wanted to to for the drama hack and sanka and sudarshan biswal he is uh, he wanted to more clarification about ndbi and ndre map and uh, then uh, uh, other question i, I think uh, the, the question was answered so friends uh, we will take these uh, you know the, these questions and uh, you know you can write more and we will send the email id uh, today's uh, program was really interesting as professor singh said we have been saying that uh, you know uh, we should be uh, covering from grassroots to global so there it was a real example of grassroots to global ramchandra saab uh, shared the experience and you know how uh, i think his voice is gone uh i think uh we will consider it uh, now we'll thank hello you can hear me and uh, my group tomorrow tomorrow we will have two, two very important speakers manoj karki he is a associate professor at uh, department of biological system engineering university of uh, washington state uh, washington state university and narendra sah uh from iit mumbai who is present in uh, ait so please join us tomorrow and uh, we will try to have uh, our technical session uh, tomorrow i'm sorry that we could not uh, uh, do the technical uh, uh, session because these two talks were very very important and uh, we wanted we and uh, ians i decided that no let it be presented uh, fully and so that uh, uh, proper message should go to the participants thank you very much for joining and uh, we will meet again tomorrow same time thank you thank you, thank you. bye it's over now <laughs>